Alright, peace. So, um, y'all have to forgive me about the past day, um, but I'm back today to talk about point five. Um, point five in the ten points of recovery is love, hate, and indifference. And um, first of all, just starting off, I want to say that, uh, you know, I do realize that there are um, several different definitions. Some of us have different definitions of love and um, The term love can be ambiguous, meaning it is open to different interpretations. And I don't want to, um, you know, argue with anybody about, you know, how they see love or whatever, what their definition of love is. Um, I will give you my definition. Um, and that's going to come a little later. That's going to be at the end. However, um, it's important why I wrote about it and why it's in, you know, the 10 points of recovery is because it's important that regardless what your definition um, of love is, um, that it is something that is an idea that's going to work for you, right, and not work against you, okay? So sometimes we, um, many times, a lot of us, we find ourselves in situations with people, um, and these situations, whether it be friends, whether it's family, and, and in the last video, um, um, I, I, I talked about navigating um, family emotions. Um, so I just want to come back and talk about how we navigate our friendships, um, which is just as important. Um, it's just as important, right? And so, um, a lot of times, like I was saying, we find ourselves in these situations with these people and, um, we feel drained, Right? You know, or you end up in uh, situations, whether it be relationships, whether it's uh, platonic friendships, your buddies, your BFFs, and all that good stuff. Or sometimes within family dynamics, too, right? Um, we feel drained by these people, or we feel confused. That confusion about exactly, well, where do you stand with them? And they also, you know... Um, a lot of times people like to throw that word insecure around, right? And so I just want to talk about what that is and how, what that's all about, you know, and why it's important um, that we understand, you know. You have to know and understand self and, 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 and in relation to the rest of the world, especially in relation to your friends um, and family members, um, in order to maximize energy, right? And so, um, when we feel confused by people, a lot of times we have these friends, um, or sometimes a family dynamics, you know, um, they might give you the biggest hug in the world, right? They hug you, they speak to you, um, say nice things to you at times, and, um, and while they're around, um, while you're with these people, a lot of times um, you get a certain feel and it feels good, right? You know, to hear those words or whatever, but then afterwards, um, they leave feeling confused. Um, they leave feeling conflicted. Um, you might not know exactly uh, where you stand. You say something about it and... Um, That's when that word insecure gets thrown around. Well, you must just be insecure or you just, you know, it's, it's something that's going on with you. Um, 
But it's important to understand that as human beings, um, there's a certain intuition that's involved. We all have the same range of emotions, and for that reason, we feel one another, don't we? Right? And this isn't something that you have to be taught. This isn't something that you have to learn in school and that your parents have to train you for when a baby comes out of the womb. Um, the reason why people love to hold babies is because a baby is vulnerable and a baby loves uh, whoever's holding the baby. And that's why we love that we get that energy from that baby because the baby's open baby's honest. So what this says is that we learn how to love from the womb. Nobody has to teach you how to love. And that's something else that we're going to get back to. But um, these people that we deal with, um, and a lot of times um, they leave us feeling confused, um, kind of leave us hanging, even though they may be nice. Well, what it is, is that um, if a person does not see your value, right? If they don't value you uh, emotionally, um, intellectually, um, or some at some physical capacity, right? Um, if they don't see you as truly worthy of their time and see you as worthy of engaging with you, then. Um, it's impossible for them to reciprocate. They can't reciprocate with you if they can't, if they refuse to empathize with you. You see what I'm saying? And so even though on the surface is, hey, and all of these little hugs and everything is so, you know, um, 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 jovial, um, if they're not able to empathize with you, they can't truly uh, reciprocate those emotions, and that's why you are left feeling confused, right? That's why you left feeling confused, you know. And then we talk about this. Um, um, we hear this word thrown around a lot. In, in relationships and in these types of situations where one of the, one of the people are not getting um, um, their needs met and um, you're insecure, right? That's a funny one. Um, well, understand something. Understand something. When we had those people, right, who you look to, you may admire them, you may look up to them, you may really enjoy their company, you might have a physical attraction to these people, right? Um, they know it. They know it. Because we all share the same range of emotions, um, they can feel that. They feel that energy from you. And so, um, when you connect with that person, they get validation from you. They get a certain level of validation from you, regardless of whether they'll acknowledge it, regardless of whether they'll openly admit it to you, or whether they really truly know what's going on themselves. Um, they do get validated because you're pretty much telling them. You're valid. You're awesome. You're this person I look up to. I cherish. I respect your opinion. I like how you look. I like how you think. You know, I like the things that you do. Here's your validation. But because they can't um, reciprocate or because they can't, um, because they, they, they don't have that same value for you, they don't look at you the same way. They don't look up to you. They don't see you as worthy um, 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 of their uh, uh, respect, so to speak. Um, they can't return that emotion. You know, so the transaction is one-sided. You see what I'm saying? So make no mistake, they're getting what they need from you. They're getting their needs met from you. You know? And they enjoy that, you know. But again, if they don't see your value, um, 
then they're not going to return those emotions. Now, um, they like you doing that. You see what I'm saying? It feeds the need with them. So if you try to back off, these people might chase you down. <laughs> they might chase you down. Well, what's going on? Why? You know? And, you know, at the root of it, a lot of times, people are selfish. We just all want what we want. So that's where those insults come in at. Um, if somebody's telling you in a relationship, you're not getting your needs met. Um, they're not being uh, totally forthcoming with you and not willing to um, um, talk about uh, what's going on uh, with you emotionally. And they just say, well, you're insecure. There's a reason. There's a reason for that, you know. Now, um, there's a reason for that. It's basically a manipulation. Um, and so what you have to do is, is ask yourself, um, is this important enough? Is this relationship, is what I'm getting? out of this relationship um, enough or, or does it outweigh the confusion, the insecurity, the uh, invalidation, the feeling left alone, okay? Because basically that's just the honest about it. Um, it's pretty much kind of, it, it, it's pretty much like a drug, you know? You feel great. When they're there, but then when they leave, then you like, you know, and that happens a lot uh, in these relationships. A lot of times we meet these women, or sometimes women, they meet guys too, I guess, um, who leave you hanging. You know, the only time y'all speak is when they call you and you do all talking and, um, you know, it's because they like that validation. But if they don't value you, they can't reciprocate it, you know. And if we want to maximize energy, we got to ask those hard questions, you know. We have to ask those hard questions. Um, is this worthy of my time? And a lot of times that kind of thing seems, um, those relationships might feel, uh, seem like it's a hard thing to, to, to cut off, um, but when you have the knowledge, when you understand those situations, it's easier, you know. That's why I wrote 10 Points of Recovery, um, but also, too, um, it's those kinds of things that lead us back in the peril. See, these kinds of relationships, man, um, men and women, um, these kinds of relationships a lot of times at the root, that a problem that leads us back into dereliction, that leads us into peril, you know. These relationships where we're not getting our needs met, you know, can cause us to do things that can land us, make us jeopardize our health and safety, our freedom, you know things like that. So you have to ask yourself, is this relationship, is what I'm dealing with, is it worth it? And I say that because I know it's a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of guys, it's a lot of people in general, period, right? We think that that's just how things are. That's just how things are supposed to go. But let me make you clear on something. There are relationships with people who cannot wait to see each other. And they get together and they transfer energy back and forth. They really, really appreciate uh, 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 what the other person has to say. Their ideas. You see what I'm saying? And a relationship like that leaves you feeling fulfilled. Doesn't leave you feeling confused. You don't worry. And when people are in, those are called healthy relationships where people don't uh, wonder well, um, where do I stand with this person, right? And so, if you think that it's just that a relationship is just supposed to be one-sided and, and you're just supposed to deal with those feelings of insecurity and, and your girlfriend or your boyfriend uh, is just supposed to 
is, is feeling confused about where you stand with them is just a natural part of life that um that's a stumbling block. That's going to be, that is what is in the way of you and what you really want. If what you want is a real relationship. And um, a lot of times what people do is, a lot of times we get childish. Um, a lot of times what we do is we're worried about what people are going to say about our friendships, you know. You're worried more about what someone outside of a potential connection is going to say about that connection that you made with another person. And because you ignore a real connection, because you met somebody that you really connect with, but you're worried about what somebody else is going to say, you go looking for uh, other connections, trying to make things happen with certain people, not realizing that. You know, they don't add up. And then a lot of times the standards of the world, what the world finds acceptable, what the world finds cool, a lot of times it's not healthy. And it's not going to be conducive to your health and you getting what you want. And so when you find those real connections, realize that those are uh, those healthy connections with people who look up to you, think the world of you, think that you're great, think you're awesome. Why don't you try uh, uh, reciprocating some of that energy back to them? And that way, um, you can have a healthy, a healthier relationship. Gives you more energy so that you can get to where you want to be. Uh, the things that you want and that person that you want to be instead of wasting our time. Uh, you know, when it comes to addiction, when it comes to dereliction, when it comes to this crook lifestyle, um, trust me, I know we make a lot of bad friends. We make a lot of fake friends. Um, we deal with a lot of people that don't deserve our time, don't deserve our energy, and we think that that is a model for how things are supposed to be. Um, but it's not. No. Uh, that's why it's important. Um, to recognize that and move on, you know. And so, um, and so, um, when it comes to love, a lot of times, um, like I said, you know, people have different understandings of it. They may see it their own way. Um, and I don't want to get in the way of how anybody wants to define things. Like I said, you know, again, I reiterate the, tw the 10 points of recovery. Uh, 10 point manual is not about telling you how to think. It's just about um, a hell of a fly getting here. Um, it's just about um, helping you think better. And get to that thing that you want. Get to those things that you want. Um, but what I want to say is this. Regardless of whatever your definition of love is. Is that it should be something, like I said, that's helping you. Not hurting you. And as far as my definition of love. My definition of love is that love is a very high elevation of understanding. Um, that's why I say unconditional, you know, um, when we love a person, uh, love will cause you to go above and beyond, you know, um, primal urges or your own needs, you know, what you want, um, love will cause you to um, do something for somebody else without wanting anything in return. And a lot of times we do that, you know. We get into these situations and we do that for other people and um, they don't reciprocate it or um, people also end up getting used, right? And um, it's love important. It's having love important. 
to get exactly what you want out of life? Um, I can't answer that question. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a miser, you know, uh, what was it? Scrooge. Charles Dixon wrote a, a story about Mr. Scrooge. He didn't like nobody and he was rich. I mean, so, uh, I can't answer the question whether or not you can get what you want without love, but I will say this, um, in order to be happy, in order to be able to practice some acceptance, um, you have to be able to accept your idea of love and accept the fact that, um, Nobody loves wrong. There's a saying, right, that I've heard a lot, um, that you can't love anybody else until you learn to love yourself. And I want to share something with you, right? Because what that does is, 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 is you know, when we get accused of, when you get accused of being um, insecure and um and, and all these different kinds of things, you left confused in these situations, these relationships, you get hurt by your friends, your family, your romantic partners, or whatever, and a lot of times we tend to close up. You know, you want to shut that off, and it's because of that idea. Um, you can't love anybody else until you learn to love yourself, right? But I just want to share something, okay, that I read, um, in this book called Bad Advice by Dr. Venus Nicolino. And um, she says that that idea, and, you know, I was happy to, to read it. I actually read the book um, the last time I was on my trip to Baltimore, I was reading this book. And um, it just really, it, it blew my mind because I was like, wow, you know, a doctor, here it is, a licensed professional that is basically corroborating what I'm saying. Um, you know, and it's just, I'm saying, it's telling you, it's just based on experience, right? Anyway, um, she says that the idea that we can't love others until we learn to love ourselves is bullshit. And that was in her words, right? So, um, she says, Dr. Helen Fisher is a biological anthropologist who is a leading expert on the biology of love and attraction. I asked her what she thought about this bad advice. Bad advice is you can't love somebody else until you learn to love yourself. It's absolutely fallacious, she said. It is based on absolutely nothing. I don't know of any data that shows it. And I've read a tremendous amount of data from around the world regarding all kinds of people who fall in love, who have no understanding of Western psychology, and have never heard the statement that you're supposed to love yourself before you love anybody else. It just does not work. It's not supported by brain circuitry. So there. Fisher's research shows what the brain looks like when it's on love. Notice I'm not saying in love. No, why? Because Fisher found that during the early phase of a relationship, a part of the brain called the ventral tegmental area, or VTA, tells certain cells to start pumping out dopamine, one of those powerful feel-good hormones. Another stimulus that triggers the same response is cocaine. But unlike cocaine, the high from romantic love is ongoing. Your mind isn't just taking a quick dip in those feel-good chemicals, it's marinating in them. Holy shit! <laughs> That's what she said. This, this is a quote. Your brain just turned into the world's most generous drug dealer. Fisher believes this explains why romantic love can cause you to lose your sense of yourself. You become obsessed with the other person, almost as if addicted to them. If your brain is a drug dealer, the one you know, the one you love is its supplier. The VTA is located in that deep primal part of the brain associated with your basic survival instincts and cravings called the reptilian core. Fisher describes the VTA as below your emotions, 
but your instinctive biological ability to love doesn't stop inside you. It also connects you to the one you love. The one you love. Alright. Okay, listen to this. Dr. Stephen Porges is a researcher and professor of psychiatry. His research has revealed that your body involuntarily responds to physical signals from the person you interact with. So when the person who sets your heart, brain, and body on fire feels the same about you, the tone of their voice, their facial expressions, and other subtle cues were reflected. Your body responds by mellowing out to let you enjoy the moment and connects you with this person. And, and on and on and on. And so what they're basically saying is that um, not only do you know how to love, um, it's not something that you have to learn how to do, but your brain is wired for all of these things. So when you meet somebody and you get all simple for them and you know, I'll some say love don't love nobody and I'm just the fool and all those kinds of things. It's because you're actually like being on a drug. You know, we're all wired that way. And so we all know what it's like. We all know what it's like to love someone, whether we look up to them, whether we admire them, whether we think they're sexy, we think they're hot, whatever. We all know what that's like. Okay, you don't have to tell anybody. And what it makes me think about is these situations with these people where uh, people think that they hang on to somebody. And you're steadily trying to convince them of how you feel about them. And you think that because they don't reciprocate, it's because they came up a certain way. Uh, they came up in traumatic situations and nobody ever taught them how to love. No, that's bullshit. We all know how to love. You see? So what you have to do is you have to ask yourself, okay, whatever situation you in, whether it's a relationship, whether it's your friends, your buddies, uh, your family, uh, your marriage, whatever, is what I'm dealing with worth the reward? That's if. Okay, you want to grow. That's if you want to get what you want out of life. And if you want to get to where you want to get. And that's what the 10 points of recovery is all about. Right? And so, um. See, I just read that because, um. You know, it's important to understand. You know, we all have the same range of emotions. We all had those same feelings, so, you know, if a person is not reciprocating with you, if a person is not getting, giving you what you need from them, um, it's not because they don't know how. <laughs> it's not because they can't, it's because that they won't. And you can't force nobody, you can't change nobody, but you can change yourself, you know. You can change yourself, you can work on you, um, and you can find people who um, think that you're great, think that you're awesome, think that you're hot shit. You know, you can connect with them and you can gain energy from them instead of feeling like you're drained, right? And confused and insecure. <laughs> All right. And so now, with that being said, I just want to make that abundantly clear. Y'all check out 10 Points of Recovery, man. It's going to sell now. I got a link on the website. You can check it out. Read a few pages. The Partridge, you know. Um, but what I would also talk about is I also want to talk about my novel. Um, because um, I said a little something about it, but I don't think that I gave you... Um, some of those who don't know, I want to be able to give you, I want to give you a little more insight on it. So first I'm going to start with some history, right? Because you know, a lot of people don't know that um, 
And this is what reverse racism is based on. Like I said before, reverse racism is not an opinion piece. It's not me trying to tell you um, about racism, anything. It's a story. But it's based on the premise. It's based on history. And the premise um, of the Haitian Revolution. Now, if you don't know... Um, in 1800, in the year 1800, um, Haiti was a French colony, right? And, of course, they imported slaves. Um, their, their biggest export was sugar cane, okay? And so, um, there was this scholar, a black man by the name of Toussaint L. Overture, and um, he wanted to help Haiti achieve its independence as far as the slave population, you know, those African Haitians. Um, so he was a black man. He was highly educated. Um, he was from a rich family. And um, he taught, he went there and he taught those slaves how to uh, fight, you know, military strategy, things like this. And they fought. And they was doing a good job. And so what to something that Overture tried to do is he thought that he could negotiate with France, you know, because um, they didn't want to keep on fighting, right? Um, they want some independence so that they could prosper. And he figured, hey, we've shown and proven that, you know, we're men. We can fight. Um, but he had a second in command. I'm going to get back to him. He had a second in command that told him that that's not going to work, and they butt heads a lot on this idea. Well, um, Toussaint L. Overture wrote a letter to France telling them that he wanted to have a sit-down with them and negotiate some terms. And so they wrote him back and said, sure, we'll negotiate, and um, invited him to France so that they could talk about it. Well, Toussaint L. Overture went to France, and when he got there, he was arrested, and they imprisoned him, and he died in prison. Well, when he did that, when they, when French did that, uh, what happened is that that left his second in command in charge. The second in command was a man by the name of Dessalines, who was ruthless. He was a ruthless uh, fighter, strategist. And that's the one who uh, Toussaint L. Overture used to bump heads with. You know, he told him, don't trust them. Don't go down. Don't go up there. And um, Toussaint went anyway. He was arrested. He died in prison. Well, now with Dessalines leading the army, he was ruthless. And the Haitian army defeated the French. But I believe it was uh, the French came back with reinforcements. I believe it was Portugal. But they defeated them too. They defeated a few world powers, the Haitians did. And in 1801, they declared their independence. And for 20 years, um, the Haitians enjoyed uh, prosperity. And at which time, at the end of 20 years, the French came back and gave them all ultimatum, told them, listen, you have to pay us this crazy sum. It was like the equivalent of millions, you know. The French wanted for their independence or we're going to continue to fight with you. We're going to continue this war that we got going on. And, you know, of course, this time the French, um, and then and remember, this is 18, this is 1801. Uh, excuse me, this is 1805. 1806. 1801, so 20 years later. Um, it was the early 1800s, you know, the ideas, you know, about race and about these Haitians who just declared their independence, you know. I'm sure it was a lot harsher than what we have today. Right? And so, um, the Haitians agreed to pay, 
You know, and they paid that debt off. I think it took them until 1945 to pay that debt. Well, the novel that I wrote, uh, Reverse Racism, is based on the idea of what if um, the Haitian Revolution set off a chain reaction of events that eradicated slavery across the globe. Which is not a far-fetched idea, because you think about it, the people back then understood the dynamics of what was going on with race. You see, race objectifies whiteness, you know, and everybody else falls short of that, you know. So, um, this novel is based on the idea of what if, um, that revolution set off a chain reaction of events that not only eradicates slavery, but change the scope of how we see race. And instead of white being right, and, 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 and all of these great things with blackness at the opposite end of the spectrum, what if things were reversed? And so our story begins in the year 2000. Um, starts with a young white woman um, I mean, our name's Carolyn, you know. And the reason why, you know, uh, I gave her that name is because um, she has a lot of white Southern pride. And she feels real strongly about her heritage. However, she lives in a world where um, the, uh, the, 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 the idea of race is opposite of what we have, you know, in our world to be, you know, uh, full of Southern pride and all that kind of stuff, you know. You ride a Harley Davidson and wear a motorcycle jacket, you consider it cool, you know. Wear Doc Martens and, and red suspenders, nobody thinks twice about it. However, that could be alarming to a person, you know, who doesn't fit into that group, so to speak. And so it's just about her adventures. Um, she has a few adventures. Um, and dealing with trust, um, dealing with manipulation, and it's a coming of age story um, about her um, seeing that the world is not necessarily black and white. There's a whole lot of gray areas, you know. And so I'm going to leave the link in the comments section, man. Y'all check out... Um, Reverse racism is a real good story. And um, with that, y'all have a good weekend. Peace.